So hello and good afternoon and welcome and thank you for joining us for our first session in the Center for Environmental Health six week maternal and child health webinar series. We are excited to have all of you here with us today. Uh, if any of you experience any tech problems, uh, feel free to send us a chat and the chat function located on the GoToWebinar panel. For those of you who are not familiar with the Center for Environmental Health, we are a not-for-profit organization that focuses on the protection of children, families, and communities from toxic chemicals. And we do that by working with consumers, workers, the government, and the private sector to make practices safe for public health and the environment. In this series, we'll be focusing on unconventional natural gas development and extraction, otherwise known as fracking, and exploring the potential health impacts for children of, women, of childbearing age, pregnant women, and as well as infants and children. We are pleased to have with us today Dr. Carol Kwiatkowski from the Endocrine Disruption Exchange. She's the Executive Director and Assistant Professor at the University of Colorado Boulder. The Endocrine Disruption Exchange is one of the first organizations to begin identifying and sharing health information on chemicals used in unconventional natural gas development, and they are dedicated to compiling and sharing scientific evidence on the health and environmental damage caused by low-level exposure to chemicals, primarily those that interfere with hormone or endocrine action, otherwise known as endocrine disruptors. Dr. Kukowski is co-author on numerous peer-reviewed papers, two of which focus on natural gas development, and has testified before the Colorado Air Quality Control Commission on the health effects of natural gas in development. During her time at the Endocrine Disruption Exchange, she has created the Critical Windows of Development website, which presents a timeline of how the human body develops in the womb, showing when low dose exposure to endocrine disrupting chemicals during development results in altered health outcomes. Dr. Kukowski today will be speaking about the public health implications of natural gas development with an emphasis on air pollution and the risks they might hold for vulnerable populations, including children and pregnant women. So Carol, welcome. I'm now going to turn this over to you. Hello, Ellen. Thank you. And thanks to everybody for joining. My screen will be up in a minute, I think. Okay, um, I don't know how you can respond, but I assume you can see my slideshow. Just going to get it into slideshow mode here. Okay, and I'll begin. When there's a big chemical spill, like we recently saw in West Virginia, it's easy to see the problem, the pollution, and it's relatively easy to see the immediate solution to clean it up. The explosion of domestic onshore natural gas operations in the past 15 years, which has brought industrial operations into our backyards and playgrounds, is an entirely different situation. The people in this photo, I know they look happy, but they live here. This is the state of Colorado, and every one of these red dots is a gas well. The Wall Street Journal estimates that at least 15.3 million Americans live within a mile of a well that's been drilled since 2000. People who live near natural gas operations have been complaining of contamination and physical symptoms for years. Drilling, fracking, and health effects are all over the news. Yet industry has continued to deny the very existence of the problem, which prohibits any sort of progress towards solutions. Natural gas operations have impacts at the local, regional, and global level. Drilling and hydraulic fracturing pose threats to water quality, impacts on water quantity, physical impacts like traffic, noise, and light pollution, social disruption in established communities, and air pollution from many different sources. My talk today will begin with an overview of the different processes involved in unconventional natural gas operations, including drilling and hydraulic fracturing. Many of these are the same processes used for development of oil wells where hydraulic fracturing is employed. Then I'll narrow the focus to air pollution, covering sources and types of air pollutants and the general health effects of those pollutants. I'll then focus in on endocrine disruption and the research that is now coming out on effects of prenatal exposure. 
I follow this for the discussion of the symptoms experienced by people living near gas operations and what you can do to address your concerns. This animation, which is not to scale, mind you, shows a vertical well going down through the water aquifer and the other geological layers to the target formation where the gas is trapped. From one well bore, several horizontal arms can be drilled that radiate in different directions like the spokes of a wheel. This drawing shows just one horizontal spoke, which could go out as far as two miles. After the hole is drilled, a wire is inserted in the borehole with a long, thin cartridge on the end that contains a steel ball bearing and explosives to make holes through the pipe and casing and create small fissures in the, in the desired geological strata. These tiny cracks will be expanded by pumping millions of gallons of fluids under extremely high pressure down the hole and out of the perforations in the pipe. This pressure increases the number and size of the fissures in the formation. The sand that is pumped in with the fluid props open the fissures just enough to release tiny bubbles of gas and fluids from underground back up to the surface. So here's a photo of a well pad during drilling. You see the tall red and white drill rig with buildings below it where all the operations on the pad are monitored and controlled. A thick slurry of many different chemicals called drilling muds is used to facilitate drilling the hole, which is called the well bore. For example, the muds reduce friction. They also help return the drilling muds to the surface and perform many different other functions. You might notice the house in the upper right corner sitting extremely close to this well pad. Once the well bore reaches the target formation, there's the opportunity for methane, which is the natural gas, and other volatile chemicals to be released from underground. For years, we've been trying to draw attention to the potential for air pollution from the drilling phase of gas operations. Initially, this was because we knew that people who live near well pads complain of symptoms at this stage, long before fracking takes place. Then later, because we took air samples and found the highest levels of chemicals during the drilling phase. And just last week, a study reported that methane emissions during the drilling stage could be a thousand times higher than previous EPA estimates. Methane is an extremely powerful greenhouse gas, and Colorado just became the first state to regulate it. But an important piece of the puzzle that nobody is talking about yet is that the raw gas at the wellhead contains a lot of other volatile chemicals that come up with the methane, hitchhikers, so to speak, many of which are toxic. Here's another pad where drilling is taking place. You can see the reserve pit where they temporarily store the cuttings and muds that come back out of the hole. One end of the pit, the one on the left in this photo, collects the drilling mud for disposal or to be reused. The other end is for fluids that come up from underground. These pits are supposed to be cleaned up and filled in with topsoil. That doesn't always happen. Now here's a photo showing a section of a well pad during hydraulic fracturing. This pad had multiple wells drilled on it, at least six that I count. You can see the row of six red Christmas trees across the top of the photo. That's what the structure of pipes coming out of the ground at the wellhead is called. Below that in the photo, you see a line of tractor trailers with white calves on the left and another on the right. Those are called frack trucks, and they provide the pressure to pump chemicals, sand, and millions of gallons of water into each well bore. The three white tractor trailers on the bottom right are sand trucks. Two million pounds of sand can be used to fracture just one well. Frac sand, which contains a lot of crystalline silica, is used as a proppet to hold open the fissures in the rock formation so the gas can be released. The blue trucks in this photo are fracking tanks. They hold water for the frac and then can be used to capture the fracking fluids when they return to the surface. The next slide. In addition to large quantities of water and sand, Fracking fluids contain chemicals that are used for a variety of different purposes. Every well may require a different mix of acids, biocides, clay stabilizers, foamers and defoamers, friction reducers, propents, surfactants, and more. In our 2011 paper, we identified 944 different products used in natural gas operations that contained a total of 632 chemicals. Only about half of those had the chemical abstract service numbers that are necessary to uniquely identify each chemical. When we searched the government and academic literature on those 353 chemicals, we found that over 75% affected the skin, eyes, and other sensory organs, 
the respiratory system, the gastrointestinal system, and the liver. Over half the chemicals could affect the brain and nervous system, and 37% were shown to affect the endocrine or hormone system. When fracking fluid returns to the surface, it's called flowback. Sometimes nearly all the frac fluid returns, but sometimes very little does. Here's a photo of frac tanks lined up with a man shifting hoses in sequence to fill the tanks. These tanks are all vented to release volatile chemicals. From here, flowback may be piped directly off the pad or held on the pad to be reinjected underground. It can be put into tanker trucks to haul to open evaporation pits or to disposal wells called deep injection wells, where it's assumed it will stay forever. Here's a photo of two evaporation pits adjacent to residences. Those are extremely large pits. You can probably see the truck backed up to the one on the left, and they're very close to those homes. This fracking operation took place in 2007. We counted 98 fracking tanks on the pad. Fracking usually takes between three to 10 days, and as you've seen, is only part of the entire process. Sometimes that distinction matters. For example, when industry claims that hydraulic fracturing has never contaminated drinking water. That's because usually water contamination comes from a faulty wellbore casing or a problem in some other stage of well development. After the fracking process ends, each wellbore will eventually be topped with what you see here. These are the Christmas trees I mentioned earlier. Methane, which is what natural gas is, often comes up wet or in salty brine that also contains many other liquid hydrocarbons and volatile gases. On the right, you can see a methanol tank with a solar panel. When the air temperature gets near freezing, methanol is injected to keep the water from freezing and bursting a pipe. The fluids and gases that come up with the methane have to be separated out at some point, and that process begins here on the well pad. If you look up to the left, you can see a separator unit. Here's another photo of a separator unit called a heater treater. The wet gas gets processed here by mixing it with a substance, usually ethylene glycol, that absorbs the water from the gas. The gases are sent through collecting pipes while the fluids are heated to boil off the water and oils and pipe them to separate storage tanks on the pad. This, the water is called produced water because it's produced by the underground formation. The upper left photo shows some produced water tanks. The oily substances that come with the gas are piped to condensate tanks. Both produced water and condensate tanks have to be vented, and they need to be constantly emptied as they refill. Now here I have to diverge for just a minute off the well pad to describe what's often done with the liquid condensate. It contains benzene, toluene, and other toxic aromatic hydrocarbons that are highly valued in today's economy. The condensate is delivered to huge industrial chemical plants where they are feedstock for practically everything society is dependent upon, as you see in the list of consumer products on this slide. And now we'll go back to the well pad. After fracking is completed and the flowback fluids have been collected and the gas is being separated from the fluids, the raw gas still contains a lot of volatile chemicals, some of which are very toxic. If there's not enough pressure or the pipelines aren't ready or if the economic value of the gas is simply not high enough, the gas is vented until everything is in place to send it to the next stage of processing. Sometimes the vented gases are burned or flared to remove some of the toxic chemicals, as you can see in this photo. This flare might be as high as 25 feet. Incomplete combustion of the flare creates yet another suite of toxic chemicals released into the air. And flares can be extremely noisy because of the volume and velocity of the gas going through the flare stack. Venting and flaring can occur for days, weeks, or even months. Once the gas leaves the well pad, it's sent to a local compressor station where it's pressurized to keep the gas in the pipeline flowing in the right direction. Each compressor station looks a little different, but they can be recognized by their large fans and vents. Compressors release a lot of fugitive gas and combustion-related emissions, including benzene, toluene, ethyl benzene, and xylene. A network of gathering pipes moves the gas to a regional processing plant where the remaining hydrocarbons and fluids are separated from the methane to produce what is known as pipeline quality dry natural gas that will eventually enter the commercially, commercial delivery system to your homes. This photo shows one small component of a processing plant in southern Colorado. Now we're at about trucks. The impact of trucks on a community cannot be overemphasized. They are used to haul chemicals, equipment, sand, water, waste, and other materials to and from the well pad. 
It can take thousands of truck trips to develop one well, and potentially tens of thousands over the life of a multi-well pad. Trucks are a source of pollution, as well as traffic, stress, and financial strain for local communities who must use and maintain the roads they travel. Everything I've talked about so far is a source of air pollution. This includes volatile chemicals in drilling products, evaporation from drilling waste pits, volatile fracking chemicals, evaporation of flowback and produced water from pits, vents on condensate and produced water tanks, separators, compressors, venting and flaring of the well bore, fugitive emissions from pipelines, valves, pneumatic equipment, and many combustion sources such as generators and trucks. The chemicals that are emitted from these sources include methane, carbon dioxide, and nitrogen oxides, which are potent greenhouse gases, other volatile organic compounds, or VOCs, sometimes hydrogen sulfide and or radioactive material depending on the geological formation, and particular mat particulate matter, which is what you see in this photo of a dust storm that recently blew through western Colorado. Studies in Colorado, Texas, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, and other states have all attributed air pollution from one or more of these chemicals to unconventional natural gas development. In a study just published last month, researchers found a strong causal link between oil and gas emissions in Utah, accumulation of air toxics such as benzene and toluene, and increased surface ozone levels. Ozone is a pale blue gas formed when nitrogen oxides mix with VOCs in the presence of sunlight. It's the main component of smog. In the stratosphere, the so-called ozone layer protects us from UV light, but at ground level, it's harmful to plants, animals, and humans. Several studies that measured and or modeled natural gas-related air emissions in various states have identified significant increases in ground level ozone as a result of natural gas development. In Pennsylvania, nitrogen oxide emissions from gas activities were 20 to 40 times higher than allowable for a single minor source. Ozone was once a summertime urban phenomenon, but is now being seen increasingly in western rural areas during the winter due to the natural gas boom, so much so that some relatively small cities are no longer in compliance with the federal regulations that set allowable ozone le levels. Even relatively, relatively low levels of ozone can cause health effects in humans. In the short term, ozone can cause difficulty breathing, coughing, and sore throat. It can also inflame and damage the airways. It aggravates lung diseases like asthma, emphysema, and chronic bronchitis. It can make the lungs more susceptible to infection. And ozone can continue to damage the lungs even when the symptoms have disappeared. Children are particularly vulnerable because their lungs are still developing until about age 18. As their lungs grow in the presence of ozone, their alveoli production is reduced, and they can end up with smaller, more brittle lungs. Women exposed during pregnancy deliver preterm, low birth weight babies with a high probability of developing asthma. Because of our concern over all that I've presented so far, in 2010, we engaged in an air sampling study in Garfield County, Colorado, pictured in this photo, which has been heavily impacted by natural gas operations from the early years of the current gas boom. This is a fairly old photo from 2008. You can see how the terrain is pockmarked by well pads and the spider web of roads that had to be built to get to them, and how close it all is to the Colorado River in the upper left. For our study, weekly air samples were taken over the course of a year from a stationary site in a neighborhood 0.7 miles from where a well pad with 16 wells was being built. There were also 130 producing wells within a mile radius of the sampling site. Given what we knew about the chemicals being used, we had the samples analyzed for a wide variety of chemicals, including many different VOCs, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, and carbonyls for a total of 153 chemicals. Over the course of the year, 61 chemicals were identified in the air samples. Shown here are the chemicals that showed up in at least half the samples. Methane, ethane, propane, toluene, formaldehyde, acetaldehyde, and naphthalene were detected in every single sample. The chemicals marked in red have been referred to as the natural gas fingerprint. They're not the most dangerous chemicals health-wise, but they can be used to identify natural gas operations as the source of air pollution. As you can see, they're found in a very high percentage of our samples. In contrast, in this rural location, we rarely found any chemicals like ethene and other alkenes, which have been sourced to road-based air pollution. 
excuse me. As part of this study, we conducted an extensive search of the government and scientific literature on health effects of the chemicals we identified. More than half of the 61 chemicals have been shown to affect the brain and central nervous system, causing headache, dizziness, confusion, memory loss, tingling in the extremities, peripheral neuropathy, all similar to complaints from residents and workers in the gas fields. They can also damage the liver, the metabolic system, and the endocrine system with impacts on reproductive health, development in the womb, and other endocrine-related endpoints. They affect the immune system, the heart, causing hypertension. They irritate the skin, the eyes, and other sensory organs, the respiratory system, and more, and many of them are carcinogens. Some of these symptoms have acute immediate onset, like rashes and difficulty breathing, but many of them are health problems that are not expressed until much later in life, long after exposure took place. One might never be able to associate the effect with the original exposure. One of the groups of chemicals we're particularly concerned about are the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, known as PAHs. PAHs are usually associated with combustion sources, like burning of coal, oil, and natural gas, or even forest fires and charbroiled food. But they're also present in and can volatize directly from petroleum sources without being burned. They're common in crude oil and are known constituents in produced water from oil and natural gas development. A few other facts about PAHs are that they attach to ultrafine particles in the air. They can travel long distances and some remain in the environment for very long periods of time. Breathing PAHs can bring them through our lungs directly to the bloodstream. They are known carcinogens and endocrine disruptors. And there's my segue to endocrine disruption. What are endocrine disruptors? Simply put, they are chemicals that disrupt hormone signaling. What many people don't realize is that hormones are responsible for nearly all our physiological functions, including development, reproduction, thyroid and immune function, intelligence and behavior, metabolism, and much more. Although the endocrine system is involved in every stage of life, proper hormone signaling is particularly critical for the brain and other organs as they're developing in the womb. This is where exposure to endocrine disruptors may be most devastating when damage can be irreversible. A key feature of hormones is that they function at extremely low concentrations in our bodies, in parts per trillion even, which has been compared to a drop of water in 20 Olympic-sized swimming pools. That's what makes exposure to endocrine disruptors so unique and so concerning. They too can have effects at extremely low concentrations. These 12 PAHs were found in our air samples in the parts per trillion range, and research has shown that they can have significant health impacts at these low concentrations. The eight PAHs with asterisks, asterisks in the left column were analyzed in a study done in New York City, where pregnant women wore backpack monitors to measure the PAHs in the air they were breathing. When the children of the pregnant women Get the next slide. When the children of the pregnant women were studied at birth, the researchers found increases in preterm births, babies born with low birth weight, and smaller skull circumferences among those with higher PAH exposure. As they tracked the children's development over time, they documented lower scores of mental development at three years of age, lower IQ scores at age five, and attention and behavioral problems at seven years of age, and most recently, childhood obesity. Because they're usually associated with combustion and urban pollution, we were shocked to see that in rural Garfield County, where we did our air sampling, the levels of PAHs were three times higher than what they found in New York City. This has dramatically increased our level of concern about the PAHs, particularly because they're not being monitored in areas impacted by gas operation. We're also concerned about chemicals like benzene, a known carcinogen, and toluene that were in our air samples and are commonly found near gas development. The effects shown in this slide are all from studies of human exposure, not laboratory animals, and they were all at air concentrations typically found in the environment, often far below EPA's stated safe levels of exposure. Both benzene and toluene are endocrine disrupting chemicals. Evidence for the connection between natural gas operations and endocrine disruption is mounting. So I want to show you some of the latest research in that area. This study was published in December 2013. The researchers measured hormone properties, estrogenicity and androgenicity, of samples they collected from surface and groundwater in Garfield County. 
samples were taken near wells with spills, in river water near gas activity, and also in control sites in Colorado and Missouri. They also measured hormone properties of 12 chemicals used in natural gas operations. Their research identified more hormone activity in water samples from sites near gas activity than from the control sites. In addition, certain chemicals known to be used in gas operations, some of which were detected at the sampling sites by another research team, displayed hormone properties similar to those found in the water samples. Given that our 2011 paper identified over 130 endocrine disrupting chemicals used by the natural gas industry, this did not surprise us. Another recent study looked at the effects of prenatal exposure. This was a retrospective cohort of 125,000 birth records in 57 rural Colorado counties. The researchers assigned each subject, each mother-infant pair, a score based on how many wells were within 10 miles of where the mother lived at the time of the baby's birth, that's the well density variable, and how far away the wells actually were from the residents, the proximity variable. Their results showed a linear relationship between well density proximity score and the likelihood of the baby having a congenital heart defect. In other words, the more wells there were in close proximity to the baby during prenatal development, the more likely the baby was to be born with a heart defect. As a reminder, 27 of the chemicals we identified in the Garfield County air samples affect the cardiovascular system. This study also found somewhat weaker evidence for neural tube defects. Another study of prenatal exposure was conducted at Cornell University. Mothers who lived within 2.5 kilometers of a well, about 1.6 miles, were compared with a control group of mothers living within 2.5 kilometers of a permitted well, one that had not yet been drilled when the child was born. Results showed that those living near a gas well had a 25% greater likelihood of having a baby of low birth weight and an 18% greater likelihood of having a baby born small for gestational age. And actual birth weights were significantly decreased. They also compared APGAR scores, which measure heart rate, breathing, muscle tone, reflexes, and color at birth. Low scores are correlated with the need for respiratory support. The prevalence of APGAR scores less than eight increased by 26% among those living near gas wells. These effects were also shown to be larger in families of lower socioeconomic status. The author points to air pollution as the most likely source and discusses polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, benzene, and other VOCs as potential causes. So that's what the science is saying so far about prenatal exposure. But what about symptoms of exposure among residents living near well pads? After years of industry saying that all that existed were anecdotal reports, we now have a few peer-reviewed studies citing symptoms cataloged from survey respondents, structured interviews, or logged in government websites. In Colorado, symptoms reported in the state's inspection incident database by residents living within a half mile of well development were headaches, nausea, upper respiratory irritation, and nosebleeds. In Pennsylvania, the following symptoms were reported by over half the people living near gas development who responded to a health survey. They included fatigue, nasal irritation, throat irritation, sinus problems, burning eyes, shortness of breath, joint pain, feeling weak and tired, severe headaches, and sleep disturbance. Another recent Pennsylvania study identified several sources of stress reported by people living near gas operations. Examples are stress over health concerns, perceptions of corruption, feeling like they were given false information, taken advantage of, or their concerns were ignored. These symptoms were all reported by at least half of the respondents interviewed. Unfortunately, exposure research like this is difficult to conduct. Baseline data from before the gas industry moved in is rarely available. Comparison or control groups are hard to create. Sample sizes are often small, and subjects are usually not randomly selected. All of this makes it difficult to accurately assess the association between chemical exposures and health symptoms. Another difficulty is that often the symptoms that are expressed can be attributed to many different causes, like allergies, colds, and flu. So people don't seek treatment immediately, or they self-medicate, and when they do see a doctor, the doctor may not identify chemical exposure as the source, and then they can't properly treat it. Many of the other potential health effects associated with these chemicals wouldn't show up for years or decades even, making the source virtually impossible to identify. 
Gauging the risk associated with air pollution is also challenged because studies often use averages in models that don't accurately account for periods of extreme exposure. They also don't typically account for the fact that we aren't exposed to only one chemical at a time. To accurately model what it's like living near a well pad, one would have to include extreme exposure events and effects of mix mixtures of chemicals, which can be the determining factor on whether or not a person's health is impacted. It's clear we don't have all the answers, and we won't have all the answers for a long time if we're waiting for proof from science. The question is, do you want to wait? Or is this enough evidence for you to say, no, not in my backyard, not in anybody's backyard, not until safer methods of extracting oil and gas are developed or alternative energy sources are fully adopted? So I encourage you to get involved and do so as soon as you're compelled. Knowledge is power, and it takes time to get educated and learn what's actually going on in your community. Most citizens get involved when it affects them locally. That is, when a well pad's drilled near their property, or a compressor station goes in near their child's school, or when they find out that there are 100 wells within a mile of the home they just purchased. It's hard to believe until you actually see what can happen to neighborhoods like the one in this photo. Or like this, where an industrial oil and gas complex is planned to be nestled in between the high school track, the park, the river, and several housing developments. The one thing to keep in mind is that polluted air is inescapable. They can't truck in clean air like they do water in communities whose water has been polluted. So what can you do? First, educate yourself. If you're new to this issue, you can start on our website. We have an introductory video, reports about chemicals, photos, and our published papers. Plenty enough to get you started. And actually, one of our most valuable resources is our links to other information. We list peer-reviewed papers in the categories of health, air, water, wastewater, ecological impacts, geology, and policy. We also list organizations at the local, state, and national levels, government resources, media reports, legal and medical information. One very good resource I want to alert you to is a toolkit put out by the Union of Concerned Scientists. It details all the issues you should consider who the different stakeholders are, including communities, governments, health officials, industry, environmental groups, etc. And it gives ideas about how to get engaged, what types of regulations to consider, and what strategies to use to accomplish your goals. What else can you do? Find a local organization near you or become the founder of your own organization. In other words, start talking to people about what's going on in your local area because every situation is different. If gas development, has not yet come to your area, but it's imminent, you're in a very unique position to get baseline testing of your air and water, which is essential to being able to prove contamination later. You can also talk to your local and state politicians. States make their own regulations, and they enforce the federal regulations. But they need to be educated, too, and they need to know their constituents are concerned. Demand full disclosure of all chemicals used by the industry and adequate monitoring of air quality. Demand that only the best industry practices be used to control air emissions, while simultaneously pressing for development of even better practices. Also demand that state agencies closely monitor adherence to the laws that are in place and have appropriate sanctions for violations. Fight for setbacks as far away as you can. A setback defines how far from home, schools, and other areas of human activity the industry can place wells, pits, compressors, or other industrial operations. Nobody knows how far is sufficient. Some studies have suggested a mile or more. Actual setbacks are nowhere near this far. Maryland specifies 1,000 feet from buildings, but most of the other states are 500 feet or less, if they have any setbacks at all. In addition, we're pushing for the medical community to get more involved in this issue. TEDx's founder, Dr. Theo Colborn, a well-known environmental health analyst, recently created a continuing medical education course for a group called Physicians, Scientists, and Engineers for Healthy Energy. They have at least 10 different CME courses you can take on the topic, which are also open for the public to view. The link is on this slide, and I would encourage you to view the presentation, take courses if you're a health professional, and share it with your colleagues. I would also highly recommend the Alliance for Nurses for Healthy Environments. They have an online community for sharing information related to oil and gas, and the link is on this slide. 
One reason the medical community is so important is that they may be the only people in a position to actually see increases in symptoms across a local population. And they can learn where gas operations exist in relation to where people are getting sick and take their concerns to their medical associations. In 2011, several associations collectively submitted comments to the EPA urging them to adopt the strongest possible standards to reduce harmful emissions from the oil and gas industry. It's a very comprehensive and strongly worded plea to strengthen the oil and gas standards to protect people's health. Without the help of doctors, nurses, and other health professionals, we may never know the full extent of the problem. So to summarize the take home messages, I just want to emphasize that this is a big deal and it's not going away. Air pollution is a major concern. So pay attention, get educated, get involved, and remember to protect those who are most vulnerable, children, the elderly, those with compromised health, and the unborn. I have a nine-year-old son and a 10-year-old daughter, and I know that nothing is as powerful as a mother protecting her children. So in the words of Margaret Mead, which I'm sure you've all heard before, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Thank you for listening, and I want to thank the entire staff at TEDx for their daily dedication to our mission, and all of our funders and donors, past and present, who keep us going year after year. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Dr. Kokowski, so much for providing such a comprehensive overview of the potential risks and providing such a wonderful um, set of resources for attendees and viewers to be able to to access. Um, that was really that was really great, and we really enjoyed the graphics and um, provided so much information. So thank you. Um, so I would like to now open up the session for questions from our attendees. Um, attendees, um, we've, we've started to receive some questions from you, but if you have not done so and you would like to ask a question, please type in your question into the chat box and we will be answering those in the order in which they are received. So, Carol, our first question is, um, doesn't NIOSH and OSHA require respiratory precautions for workers at drilling sites due to silica dust? Um, yes, I imagine they do. I'm not an expert on that. Actually, there was a really good study out. The author's last name, I believe, is Eswein, E-S-S-W-E-I-N. And that study, I think, just came out in 2013. And they talk all about the um, health impacts of silica dust in the natural gas industry. And um, you might find the answer to that question there. Great. And now we have another question from Claire Baldwin. And her question is, is the same condensate from gas well chemicals used directly for these household products? If you could explain this more, I'd be grateful. So um, my understanding, and again, I don't know the process intimately, and um, they don't use necessarily use the condensate as it is, but they take that and they refine it and they separate out the chemicals and they create more chemicals. You know, this is where the 80,000 chemicals in commerce um, statistic comes from. Uh, many, many of them are petroleum-based. And um, then they are used both in the products that we use as well as um, um, in the process of creating those products. And so they're in plastics, they're in um, flame retardants, pesticides, all of those chemicals you hear about that are part of our daily lives. And um, they can off-gas from those things. Um, in a, a study we were looking at, or we were conducting a, a literature review recently and um, looking at benzene, toly, toluene, ethyl benzene, and xylene, and the levels found indoors were four times higher than what they're finding outdoors. And that was pretty shocking to us, but it's off-gassing from these household products, which is a, a whole other topic I could give a slideshow on. <laughs> but it's a good question. Thank you. Great. And then we have another question here from Rich Kaplan, who says, what is a healthy or average healthy APGAR score? Yeah, I saw that on the chat box, and I'm sorry, I don't actually know. I'm not a medical professional. Um, maybe someone else could chat a reply to that. What's yeah, the average healthy I would, I would suggest score? maybe maybe we can, um, we'll take down that question, Rich, and we'll try to get back to you and get you that information. Um, so we have another question here from Glenn Sanders, who says, are you currently working with any attorneys to take legal actions forcing regulatory agencies 
to include thorough health impact assessments in their environmental impact statements? Um, TEDx is not working in that capacity, no. Um, but I know there have been several publications looking at health impact assessments um, and stressing the importance of them. I think it is a good idea. Um, but specifically to answer that question, I would say no. We have a question from Vicki Goldstein who says, are there opportunities or funding to test air quality and pollution if there are wells within a mile or two from schools? Um, I know of some local groups. There's some, uh, um, oh, I'm drawing a blank right now. It's a group we call the Bucket Brigade. They go out and they do air samples. Um, it's, it's, it's relatively inexpensive to take quick and easy air samples um, of some of the basic chemicals. Um, but to get a full suite, it's a little more expensive. And I don't know about you know funds for individuals to just be able to do air testing where they are. I think getting um, get, working with a community group and maybe getting grant funding to do something like that would be a good idea. Yeah. So we at CEH actually um, we've I think maybe Carol, what you're thinking is Global Community Monitor. Yes, that's um, it. Thank you. Who's, who's run by actually Denny Larson, um, and mm -hmm. they they help uh, with community air monitoring. So. Um, Vicki, I would say that um, they would, you know, if you have, if you have questions about this, feel free to reach out to me after this, um, and um, I can tell you about some potential opportunities. But again, as Carol said, um, usually these are group community projects. So, um, but I'd be happy to provide some information after the, after the webinar. Um, so our next question is Susan Van Dolsen says, here in New York, we are fortunate that there is a de facto moratorium on drilling but there are exposures to emissions from compressor stations, pipelines, and metering from regulating stations. We are trying to raise awareness and health impacts from infrastructure and to engage elected and appointed state and local officials to understand the connections. Um, she says, we support your efforts um, to get the commu medical community more involved. Do you have any other suggestions? Mm. Um, other than what I put on the slide, I don't really. I, th I think the first step is for them to start voicing their concerns um, through their medical associations. I know in Pennsylvania there is a clinic that they have specifically um, devoted to this, to educating people, um, and it, it's sort of trickling in little by little different ways that um, people in the medical field um, are stepping out. Um, I guess I don't really have other suggestions, but thanks for the question. Great. And then we have another. We have a, we have a bunch of people thanking you, Carol, for uh, the presentation. Um, and You're then welcome. There's, there's a question here from Tanya Shrobodnak who says, "Are you or other researchers currently conducting new epidemiological studies examining exposures and health effects?" There is a very large study going on at the University of Colorado in Boulder um, that is, I, oh, I don't want to misspeak. It's funded by a variety of different sources, um, and there are a lot of different features to that and aspects and different groups working on it from different angles. So um, that's some exciting research that's underway, um, but it could be a long time before we hear much, uh, you know, in, in the progress of scientific research. Um, you know, I don't uh, know exactly what's going on in other places. Um, Cornell U University has put out some good studies. Um, that's the one I know the most about is at the University of Colorado. Okay, great. Then we have Can I mention too that someone did say a bunch of people wrote in saying that an APGAR score of 8, 9, or 10 is good. <laughs> Just to answer that question. And then we'll, we'll address a couple more questions here. We have another question from Arturo Garcias Costas, who says, how big was the study size regarding low birth weight and proximity to wells? Um, that's the Hill study. Um, oh, gosh. I don't know off the top of my head. Um, 
you know, that we may we may be able to get this information to to that person afterwards as well. Um, if we can't. Yeah, I'm can't. sorry, I don't remember. I should have that on the slide. Thank you. Okay, we have a question here. I think this will, this will be one of our last questions from Erin Steva. Uh, says, can you outline the unique risks unconventional extraction presents in comparison to conventional oil production? Well, it's the hydraulic fracturing that's so um, you know that's unique about this unconventional and different ways of drilling. They do um, horizontal and vertical wells. Um, so traditionally, I imagine they used drilling muds, you know, with the similar suite of chemicals, and so that would be a, some source of pollution, and um, and then also, you know, the venting and flaring and all that that goes on. So I think what's different are some of the sources that are related to hydraulic fracturing in particular, all the ones I mentioned about um, the chemicals that are used and the um, storage and transfer of the waste. And um, also, I mean, a big one really is all of the um, combustion-related sources of air pollution on the well pad during hydraulic fracturing because of all the um, machinery that they need and the trucks and everything. All those truck trips aren't needed for a, a traditional conventional well. Great. I think that's what's different. Okay. So we have, Carol, if you don't mind, do you mind answering a couple more questions here? We, we have, we have some that would be questions. fine. Okay, great. So there's another question here from B. Bunn who says, do you have any comments on how green screen assessments may help us help communities we serve? The green screen for uh, looking at alternatives, um, I assume is what he's referring to. Um, Gosh, I imagine the natural gas industry would benefit from looking at um, safer alternatives to the chemicals they're using. They're using so many different things, though, that um, I don't know. I know that they're within the industry. They are some um, of the companies are trying to improve what they use. Um, I don't know specifically if the green screen's being employed or not. But it's a good idea. We have another question here from Bonnie Hamilton, who says, does the endocrine disruption exchange work with groups in Canada, and if so, in what capacity? You know, our role is to um, supply uh, scientific information to, to distill and disseminate what's coming from the science to other groups. And so um, we are happy to do that for anybody who contacts us. So. Um, yes, we would definitely work with groups in Canada. Oh, we don't, not necessarily working um, with anyone at the moment. Great. So I think that we, we have a number of other questions here, and I think what we'll do is, um, if people don't mind, we will, um, I will, Carol, I'll direct those questions to you after the webinar session. Um, okay. And then you can, you can feel free to, to answer those questions. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll also help with answering as best as we can. Um, someone asked about whether the slides will be available from the webinar session. And this, this, this recording will actually be up on the Center for Environmental Health website. So people will be able to access uh, the presentation and they'll be able to see the slides that way. So people, the answer is yes, you will be able to access um, the information that was presented here today. So thank you to everyone for your questions. Um, we are coming now to the end of the hour, um, and we, we will need to wrap up. So I want to urge those of you who have not yet um, registered for future sessions to go ahead and, and do that. Um, next week, we will be having, we'll be joined by Dr. Jerome Paulson. He is the director of the Mid-Atlantic Center for Children's Health and the Environment at the Children's National Health System. Dr. Paulson is a professor of pediatrics and a pediatrician by training, and we'll be talking about the unique vulnerability that exists for children due to their physiology and the potential for health impacts from unconventional natural gas extraction and development. And then following Dr. Paulson's talk, we will have a number of other speakers talking about a range of different topics every Monday until June 2nd. Um, so I urge you, uh, people who have not registered, to go ahead and do so. Um, and we'll also be administering a survey poll via email. So please, if people take a few minutes to 
answer that, that would be great. We're always looking for ways to improve the work that we do. So thank you again, Dr. Kulkowski, for joining us. You gave an excellent presentation. And thank you to everyone uh, for attending this webinar. And we hope that you'll join us next week. Have, have a great rest of your day. Thank you.